Okay, let's, I think that's, uh, okay, let's get started. Um, I'm Shulei Zian, uh, I'm the host of uh, today's uh, Connect Matters seminar. Uh, before we get started, I have uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, so um, the talks, uh, in addition to, uh, will be recorded, uh, the seminar will be recorded. And uh, after the seminar, I will post the Zoom recording on our physics event web page. And also that uh, it will become available on YouTube, thanks to our uh, no, physics, uh, thanks to Mike and our physics marketing and the communication committee for setting this up. And uh, uh, today we'll have um, Matthew uh, Yankovic from University of Washington give a talk about the twisted uh, graphene bilayers, uh, not bilayers, I think you will talk about other right, systems. And uh, next week, we'll have a, a series talk from uh, Barry uh, Bradling from uh, University of I Illinois talking about uh, uh, topology in uh, charge density wave systems. So, okay, with that, I think. Okay, good. Okay, um, sorry. All right. Uh, let me, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, today's uh, speaker, uh, Matthew uh, Yankowitz. Um, here. Matthew received his bachelor uh, degree in physics from Stanford University in uh, 2011, and he got his PhD in uh, physics from University of Arizona in 2015. Uh, he then moved to uh, Columbia University and was a postdoc uh, research associate in uh, Corey Dean's group for about three years. Uh, last septem September, he landed a joint position, right? It's a joint position of uh, assistant professor in the Department of Physics and the Department of Materials Science uh, and Engineering at the University of Washington. Um, Matt is known for his experimental study of novel electronic state in two-dimensional materials, including uh, Dirac fermions in uh, graphene on boron nitride and the superconductivity in uh, twisted bilayer graphene. He has picked up uh, several awards for his research achievement in this uh, hot area, I'd say. Um, he was one of the finalists for the uh, 2019 um, Belavanic uh, um, region, Regional Awards for Young Scientists and recently he received the uh, Young Investigator Program Award from the Army Research. So without further ado, I'll stop sharing and Matt, if you may, share your screen and uh, go ahead. Great, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the introduction. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, well, virtually. And Can you see my screen now? Not yet, yeah, okay. Yeah, please go ahead. I can see your screen now. Okay, great. Okay, um, so thanks again. Uh, just as a logistical note, I have the chat open, but if you have a question at any time, feel free to just interrupt me verbally or post it in the chat. I'll, I'll try to get to them. You know, I'd rather have this be clear than get through all the slides. Um, so, uh, as, as Shirley mentioned, I'll be talking about tunable correlated and topological states in twisted graphene heterostructures. And uh, this research is kind of a mixture of some of the things that I did as I was leaving my postdoc at Columbia, and uh, kind of more so some of the things that I've been doing in the past year um, since I started the faculty position here at UW. Okay. Um, let's see. Great. So here's an outline of the talk. Uh, first, I'll give a brief introduction into what are more van der Waals heterostructures, and then I'll move on into some of the things that we've been doing over the past two years or so, uh, utilizing these structures. And, uh, you know, namely, that's been looking at various twisted numbers of layers of graphene, either two layers, four layers, or three layers of graphene, and asking what kind of correlated and topological states can we get in these systems, and how can we tune and control them? And then finally, if I have time, I'll, I'll finish with some concluding remarks. All right, so, uh, you know, probably for this community, we don't need much of an introduction here, but 
Um, over the past 15 or 16 years, we've learned that there's this wide family of Van der Waals materials that can be isolated down to an atomic monolayer. And uh, this can be done using a scotch tape exfoliation technique that was discovered by uh, researchers at the University of Manchester. And they first used this for graphene and a few other materials, but now we have dozens and maybe even over 100 materials, which we can isolate down to an atomic monolayer. And this process, if you haven't seen it done, is actually quite simple. You know, you take a bulk crystal of uh, Van der Waals material, and by Van der Waals material, I mean one that has strong in-plane bonds, but it has layers that are stacked by a weak Van der Waals adhesion. And you put this crystal onto a piece of scotch tape, and you fold it onto itself, and you rip it apart over and over. And in doing so, you, uh, you know, stochastically thin down these layers, and you can laminate this onto a substrate of choice. Typically, we use silicon. And when you peel it away, you have this statistical mixture of different uh, thicknesses of, uh, of the parent crystal. And if you look very carefully, uh, you can see that you can get down to a single monolayer or bilayer or trilayer. And uh, nature has helpfully color coded the different number of layers via the optical contrast. So it's easy for us to identify um, how many layers that we're dealing with. And uh, you, know, you might think that after 15 years, we would have developed a more high-tech way of doing this. But really, uh, scotch tape turns out to be uh, the gold standard in this field. OK, um, so uh, you know, why is this interesting? Well, it turns out that effectively, you know, every type of electronic property that we know of in a three-dimensional bulk crystal, we, in the past 15 years, have developed or discovered an analog in a two-dimensional atomically thin sheet. So at the top here, I have kind of your standard metal insulator semiconductors. Uh, graphene is a canonical example of a semi-metal, or a nitride a canonical uh, example of an insulator. And on the bottom, we have uh, more exotic electronic properties like ferromagnets, superconductors, topological insulators. And so this really gives us a wide variety of, of things to do experimentally. But for the purpose of this talk, I want to just focus on two of these materials, uh, graphene and boron nitride. And really, in particular, all of the action will be happening in the graphene. The boron nitride is uh, just coming along for the ride and, and making the quality of the graphene higher. So this talk will really be focusing uh, just on uh, sheets of carbon atoms. Now, the real power of this field came in the development by my postdoc advisor, Corey Dean, about a decade ago of a technique in which you can actually take these isolated Van der Waals materials and assemble them into a heterostructure on demand. So this is done by using a flexible elastomer stamp with a polymer on the underside. And you align this under an optical microscope above a flake that you've previously exfoliated down to an atomically thin limit. And then you bring these together, you heat the substrate, and then you peel away the stamp. And the flake prefers to adhere to the stamp instead of the substrate. And in this way, you can delaminate the flake from the substrate. And if you repeat this procedure over and over again, you can create a structure of various atomically thin crystals. So here's an optical microscope image of a symbol structure. It's a monolayer graphene encapsulated between two thin sheets of insulating boron nitride. And we can cut this thing in half and look at it edge on in a cross-sectional TEM image. And you can see these individual layers of boron nitride uh, sheets, then a monolayer of graphene, and then more boron nitride. And critically, there's no uh, signature of interfacial contamination here. Um, these, these Van der Waals adhesions prefer to uh, kind of self-aggregate any contamination at these interfaces, and then we can move it out of the active portion of the channel. So this gives us a way to create heterostructures on demand that are very high electronic qual uh, quality, you know, extremely high mobility. And uh, uh, these structures are something that we can easily create in the lab, but it's something that you would never find in nature. You know, you would never go outside and find a monolayer of boron nitride encapsulated between thicker sheets of boron nitride. Um, that's not energetically favorable for nature to grow, but it's something that we can create as we desire. And of course, we can, with our wide variety of different materials, create uh, almost an infinite set of different uh, metamaterials or these Van der Waals header structures. But you know, additionally, uh, oh, sorry, okay, so there's a question. How do you detach a header structure from the PDMS? Yeah, so that's a great question. So once we're done building it, um, then uh, we take a clean substrate that has nothing on it, and we melt well above uh, the glass transition temperature of the polymer, the PVC or PC polymer. 
And that effectively delaminates the polymer onto the substrate, and then we can anneal or chemically clean that polymer away. And this leaves us with just this stack of flakes left on the header on the uh, on the substrate. Okay, uh, but you know these these materials are uh, okay. Uh, what gives a contrast in the TEM? How do you recognize the graphene? So that question, unfortunately, I don't know the answer to. Uh, this this is not my work. This is an image that was taken. Um, you know, uh, I think even before I entered into this field. Or, or just or just after. So I actually don't know the details of this image. I suspect that it's due to the fact that these are different, um, either carbon or boron and nitrogen atoms, but I'm not exactly sure why that leads to a different contrast. So unfortunately, I have to punt on that question, but it's a very good one, thank you. Yeah, if I, can I say something? Yes, please. Yeah, so, so it surprises me because Boron and nitrogen together have basically the same valence electron density as, or electron density as graphene, and most scattering techniques measure the electron density. So it's really surprising you can see the difference between graphene and boron nitride, I think. Well, I'm not a microscopist, so I don't know. No, I'm, not a, I'm not an electron microscopist either, so I'm sure that they know the answer to this, and unfortunately I don't. And that's something that I've never thought of before, so I, I will try to dig into this and find out why, but that, that's a really good question. Um, so thank you for asking that. Okay, uh, you know, so another interesting feature of these systems when you stack two materials comes from what uh, comes from an understanding of uh, what happens when you look at the symmetry of these crystals uh, on top of each other. So graphene and boron nitride are structural isomorphs. They both have this honeycomb structure. Graphene is made up of carbon atoms. Boron nitride is made up of alternating boron and nitrogen. And when we overlay the two, um, due to a slight difference in the lattice constant, what we find is the emergence of this long wavelength uh, uh, kind of triangular uh, superstructure, which we call a moray pattern. And uh, the period or the wavelength of this moray pattern depends on the twist angle between these crystals and the mismatch in the bonding constant. So as I rotate one crystal on top of another, you can see that this uh, triangular superstructure grows and shrinks. It's longest when the crystals are aligned and it's shortest when they're maximally misaligned. And uh, this is purely geometric. I'm not playing any tricks here. I'm literally just overlaying two honeycomb structures and, and rotating them. And it turns out that this isn't just you know, a, a quirk of geometry. It's something that we can really see in these materials. So here's a sample of graphene and boron nitride that I imaged with scanning tunneling microscopy uh, during my PhD now you know, eight years ago or so. And what you find is that we see two uh, honeycomb type structures in the lattice. Um, what I'm highlighting in white is a, is a small honeycomb structure, uh, which is the graphene, uh, the, carb the honeycomb structure of the carbon atoms making up the graphene lattice. And then we have this larger, uh, you know, superstructure, which emerges due to this geometric interference pattern between the graphene and the boron nitride. And this is called the Moray pattern. And uh, we can tune the period of this moray pattern by making different samples with different twist angles. These are all imaged on the same length scale, and you can see that this moray superstructure changes its wavelength substantially with the twist angle. And we can map out this dispersion between the twist and the moray, and it, it follows what geometry tells us it should. So, uh, you know, why is this important? Well, you might think that if you put graphene on a very good insulator like boron nitride, which has something like a six electron volt band gap, then nothing should happen to the low energy electronic structure of the graphene. And indeed, this is the case if they're at a very big twist angle and this moray is, a, is very short wavelength. In that case, the graphene's electronic structure is described by this uh, Dirac-like dispersion with the vanishing density of states at the Dirac point. And if we characterize it with electrical transport in a field effect transistor type geometry, where we can tune the electron density or equivalently tune the Fermi energy, then what we find is that with zero gate voltage, where the Fermi energy is aligned at this neutrality point, the resistivity is high because there's a small number of states. And then as we tune the Fermi energy with the gate voltage either into the valence or conduction bands, there's a larger number of states. We're putting more charge into the system, so the resistance drops in an ambipolar fashion for both P and N type doping. Now what happens if I put graphene with a small twist angle on boron nitride? Well, this moray pattern acts like a periodic potential for the graphene. 
And if graphene were described by the Schrodinger equation, then this would open band gaps. Um, but because graphene is derived, described by the Dirac equation, it actually creates replica neutrality points, but at finite energy in the graphene band structure. Essentially, the energy at which the reciprocal lattice factor of this Moray potential couples uh, scattering across uh, the Fermi surface of the graphene. And now if I measure transport in this structure, uh, I see similar behavior around the neutrality point, but then I see that I also find additional peaks in, uh, at finite doping in both the valence and conduction band, so for both P and n-type doping. And these arise when I tune the Fermi energy to these secondary neutrality points at finite energy. So this is at room temperature, the effect is even more profound at low temperature. So even though they're boron nitride as an insulator, this moray pattern is able to modify the low energy electronic properties of the metallic graphene. Now, another way we can tune this moray pattern is not by changing the wavelength, but by changing the, uh, the amplitude of the moray pattern itself. And the amplitude is set by how strongly these layers couple. So imagine if I bring two layers infinitely far apart, they won't care about the alignment. And on the other hand, if I bring them very close together, uh, the effect of this moray pattern can become even more profound. Uh, so the way that we do this is following a technique that I developed a few years ago during my postdoc in which we uh, borrow upon high pressure techniques that are commonplace in the bulk crystal community, but integrate these planar van der Waals uh, heterostructure devices into these uh, high pressure apparatus. And I'm, I won't go through the details of how we do this, but the end result is that when we apply hydrostatic pressure, you can think of this as effectively pushing all of these uh, van der Waals layers towards, you, towards each other. And the electronic coupling between layer scales exponentially with their distance. So we can actually drive up a strong interlayer coupling by applying high pressure to these, uh, van der, to these heterostructures. So we can test whether this works by taking this aligned graphene on boron nitride and measuring some property in transport that should be uh, coupled to the strength of the moray potential. So I didn't mention this before, but actually this moray potential uh, breaks the sublattice symmetry of the inversion symmetry of the graphene lattice. The inversion symmetry is what protects the Dirac crossing at low energy. And when you break this inversion symmetry, you actually open a band gap. So you turn graphene from a, a semi-metal into a semiconductor. And at ambient pressure, this band gap is around room temperature, uh, something like 30 milli electron volts. Now when we apply high pressure to this aligned graphene on boron nitride and measure the band gap, what we find is that it grows super linearly with pressure. So this band gap is something that's proportional to the strength of the Moray potential. And we can see experimentally that we're able to enhance it uh, with pressure. So this tells us that we've now gained an experimental tuning knob, not only on the wavelength of the Moray potential with a twist angle, but also on its amplitude with pressure. So we can put these all together and I can tell you a bit about the ways in which uh, you know, we, can, we can tune van der Waals heterostructures generically. And uh, you know, th these are very tunable systems which have a lot of experimental tuning knobs. So what I've told you about is that you can stack different materials in different orders and create designer heterostructures. You can twist the different layers within the structure and this can create modifications to the electronic properties. You can change the interlayer spacing or more generically, you can apply strains to these materials to further modify their band structures. And this is in addition to the things that we already like about low density two-dimensional materials that you can modify their properties with charge doping and electric fields and these field effect transistor geometries. And of course, also the usual tuning knobs of temperature and magnetic field and so on. So there's, there's really a lot of experimental tunability in these platforms. And this is something that's, that makes them really attractive uh, to investigate. Okay, so uh, let me pause here before I move on to some of the things that we've been doing in the past two years or so to see if there's any outstanding questions. Okay, if not, I'll, I'll press on. Okay, uh, so what I want to talk about now is how we can utilize these Moray van der Waals heterostructures to realize systems with tunable uh, correlations and topology. So uh, what I've been talking about so far is graphene on the insulator boron nitride, but you can imagine that if I put graphene on graphene, uh, if I stack two metals together instead of a metal and an insulator, the, we, the effect of this interlayer coupling can be more profound. Uh, so, um, what happens if we stack and twist uh, two sheets of monolayer graphene to create twisted bilayer graphene is that we also create this moray potential. 
And this moray potential now you can think of in some very hand-waving and oversimplified way as being kind of artificial graphene with a large lattice constant. And if I were to solve a type binding model to look at the band structure of twisted bilayer graphene, it turns out that it very much mimics that of monolayer graphene, but over very different energy scales, owing to the, to the large difference in the lattice constant. So the band structure of monolayer graphene has these Dirac crossings at the K and K prime points. And then if you go higher in the band structure, it has a band host singularity and eventually a massive band uh, with opposite sign um, at, at high energy. And the overall energy scale needed to completely fill a monolayer graphene band is something on the order of 10 electron volts, which is not accessible in, in standard uh, low energy transport measurements. But if I have a twisted bilayer graphene sheet with a small twist angle and a large moray pattern, I get a very similar structure, but now over orders of magnitude smaller energy scales. So here, for just the twist angle I've chosen, you only need to go to something like 100 MeV uh, to fill these bands above which there's a small energy gap to higher remote dispersive bands. Uh, that's not exactly shown in this calculation, but in others, we, we indeed find that uh, this low energy band is gapped. And, uh, you know, so this sets up a, a situation where um, we can effectively think of, as I said, this, this twisted bilayer graphene is artificial graphene with a large lattice constant. And indeed, both theory and, and recent STM uh, suggests that electrons like to arrange themselves uh, on these AA stack sites, and they don't like to arrange themselves on these AB and BA stack sites. So we can really think of this as a sort of like triangular lattice in a, in a somewhat oversimplified way of electrons living on this large unit cell, which for twist angles of around one degree, the unit cell of the Moray pattern is something like uh, 10 to 15 nanometers. Okay, uh, so I want to take more seriously now this, uh, you know, these low energy bands, these more mini bands, and ask really how small of an energy scale can they exist over. And to do this, I want to give you kind of a cartoon perspective on why these flat bands emerge in the first place. Um, so to think about twisted bilayer graphene, I can think about two monolayer graphene sheets in momentum space that are twisted. And uh, this allows me to set up this sort of moray briwan zone that describes the system, where the corners of this moray briwan zone are made up of the K and K point, the K points of the top and bottom graphene layers in one valley, and the K prime points of the top and bottom graphene layers in another valley. And so if I just take a, a cut along a single momentum direction, I see that I have two direct cones side by side, and their offset is set by the twist angle in real space. Now, this doesn't tell the whole story. I haven't turned on interlayer coupling yet. And when I do, what happens is uh, these crossing points at the gamma point of the, of the moray briwan zone uh, form an anti-crossing, and they gap out. And uh, what, that, what that means is that these bands get pushed down towards uh, the neutrality point. So you can imagine that for the right ratio of the offset of these neutrality points, or these Dirac cones, and the size of this hybridization gap, we can really get uh, rather flat bands uh, to emerge. And a more serious calculation of the bandwidth uh, shown in the blue line here shows that this bandwidth has a tendency to want to vanish around the so-called magic angle of about 1.1 degrees before it eventually reemerges as, as we reduce the twist angle further. Uh, we think the actual bandwidth is not quite this small, but this is kind of the, the zeroth order calculation that you can do. Now, the other relevant energy scale in the system is the strength of uh, Coulomb interactions between electrons in the, in the graphene sheet. And uh, while we don't exactly know this energy scale either, uh, we think that it scales roughly with this Moray potential and uh, is something on the order of a few tens of milli electron volts at twist angles around one degree. And this sets up a scenario around this magic angle where we have an inversion of the usual hierarchy of energy scales in the system. So rather than the kinetic energy scale dominating the Coulomb energy scale in which we would expect that our low energy states are mostly uncorrelated, around this magic angle, we have this inversion where the Coulomb energy scale dominates or is at least comparable to the kinetic energy scale in the system. So here we would anticipate that uh, you know, correlations can define the ground state at low temperature. 
Now, I, will, I also promised topology in the, in the title of this talk, so I, I want to give some intuition to how topology enters this problem. Um, so we know that, uh, you know, because graphene is described by the Dirac equation, it has this winding number the, or, a, or a berry phase associated with its Dirac-like particles at low energy. And the berry phase or the winding number is opposite uh, for the two valleys at K and K prime in monolayer graphene. Uh, but in contrast, because these uh, direct cones are coming from the same valley in the top and bottom graphene layers and twisted bilayer graphene, it turns out that they actually have the same winding number of either plus one or minus one, depending on which of the original valleys that we're examining. So to be a bit more clear about that, you know, we can draw carefully the Brillouin zones of the two monolayer graphenes in blue and orange, and then the mini or the Moray Brillouin zone in, in green. And you can see that if I examine, uh, you know, these mini Dirac cones around either the K or K prime points, within each valley of the original graphene, uh, the winding number is the same uh, within, the, within the more Avery wand zone. So it's either plus one at every point in this, at every corner in this mini Brillouin zone, or minus one. And again, this is coming from the fact that K and K prime have opposite sense of this, uh, you know, the chirality of this winding number. All right, so why is this important? Well, if I look at the twisted graphene, twisted bilayer graphene band structure, it very much resembles monolayer graphene, uh, but over a smaller energy scale within the original K and K prime points of the monolayer graphene uh, Brillouin zone. But critically, like monolayer graphene, a special symmetry of the, la of the lattice uh, necessitates that we have Dirac crossings at zero energy. And this is called the C2T symmetry, where T is time reversal symmetry that transforms one value to another, and C2 is 180 degree rotation symmetry. And you can kind of think of it like an inversion symmetry if you want. Now, uh, breaking these symmetries can actually gap these Dirac points and lead to some sensitivity of the fact that we have different winding numbers in each of these mini Brillouin zones. And so you can realize different types of, uh, of effective turn numbers when you integrate over the entire band, depending on whether you break the C2 or the time reversal symmetry. I don't wanna go into too much detail on this, but let me just give you a, a kind of a simple model that maybe makes this a little bit simpler. So we can calculate the twisted bilayer graphene band structure in what's called the chiral limit, where we turn off tunneling at the A, B, and B, A sites, Oh, sorry, we turn it off at the AA sites, but we leave it on at the AB and BA sites. And this actually leads to identically flat bands. And then we can map this problem into that of a quantum Hall ferromagnet, where we have uh, some sort of highly degenerate Landau level. In this case, it has uh, eightfold degeneracy, two for spin, two for valley, two for sublattice, with contrasting churn number of plus or minus one, depending on the exact time reversal symmetry relation between these. And uh, so this naturally allows topology to enter into this problem potentially. And I'll say a bit more about specifically when that can happen. All right, so to summarize here, we now know over the past two years uh, of quite a, a wide variety of these Moray van der Waals heterostructures in which correlations and sometimes but not always topology are important. And so there's a variety of different twisted graphene heterostructures, uh, but also twisted, uh, trilayer graphene or twisted TMDs, um, and very likely more to come uh, in, in the following years. Um, because this is a very large field, I just want to talk about some of the things that I've done. So for now, I'll focus on a subset of these systems, in particular these three here, twisted bilayer graphene, twisted double bilayer graphene, and twisted monolayer bilayer graphene. So let me start with the simplest, which is twisted bilayer graphene, uh, just two rotated sheets of monolayer graphene. So I, I want to tell you very quickly how we make these experimentally. Uh, we use the so-called Terran stack method, although we've kind of developed it further by now, uh, but the, the base idea remains the same. We laminate a flake of boronitrite only over half of a graphene sheet, and then when we pull it away, we actually tear the graphene sheet into two. Then we can rotate the two graphene sheets with respect to each other by the desired amount, and then pick up the remaining half of the graphene that was left on the wafer initially. And doing this allows us uh, to make a twisted bilayer graphene heterostructure with reasonably good control over the twist angle. 
Uh, for the most part now, we can get it to within a few tenths or even hundredths of a degree with pretty high reliability. So if I measure transport and twisted bilayer graphene, I have to tell you what happens as a function of twist angle. So if I measure a large twist angle, say larger than three degrees, then the moray pattern is small and the hybridization is not very relevant. And effectively, transport looks like measuring two monolayer graphene sheets in parallel. So I'm going to show you the conductance now. The conductance is small at the neutrality point at zero doping. And then as I dope with electrons and holes, the conductance grows. Now, if I do the same measurement, but with a smaller twist angle of about one and a half degrees, I see that the behavior is similar around the neutrality point, but then it's very different as I go to high doping. The conductance saturates and then eventually drops to identically zero uh, for both uh, electron and hole type doping before recovering to a higher value as I dope even further. Um, so this is somewhat remarkable in and of itself. I've taken two metallic graphene sheets and by stacking them at the right twist angle, uh, I can actually tune to a, to a band insulating state. And uh, you know, it turns out that this can be understood from just a single particle band structure calculation of twisted bilayer graphene. And I've kind of already gone over this, uh, but to just say it again, you, know, you get these uh, uh, moray uh, mini bands at low energy, and then there's an energy gap towards these higher dispersive remote bands. And so when we tune the Fermi energy to full filling of these bands, you know, we, we eventually tune the Fermi energy into a band gap. And this is where we see this insulating state. Um, so the doping that we need to achieve this insulating state tells us something about the twist angle. In the sense that it tells us how many electrons per moray unit cell we need to completely fill this low energy moray mini band. So we call this doping plus or minus n sub s, or the, the density we need uh, of carriers to completely fill these low energy bands. OK. Uh, so now what happens when we go to this magic angle of about 1.1 degrees where we expected uh, the bands to be very flat? Um, all right, so there's a question, does gating break the z-symmetry here? Um, yes, it does. And uh, the effect is to basically offset the energy of these two, uh, let me go back is to basically offset the energy of these two Dirac cones as we apply a perpendicular electric field. Um, but critically, the C2 symmetry is not broken by gating. And the C2 symmetry in twisted bilayer graphene is what's protecting these Dirac crossings. So those persist, but the Dirac cones may offset slightly. In the end, in twisted bilayer graphene, it turns out that the electric field or doping doesn't change much um, in terms of the overall band structure. Okay, um, so you know, as we predicted theoretically, what happens if we go to this magic angle of 1.1 degrees where we anticipated that correlations may play an important role? Well, in this case, the overall uh, phenomenology looks pretty similar. We see this kind of V-shaped conductance and neutrality. We see insulating states at plus and minus full filling. Note that I've normalized everything to full filling here. So the actual densities you need are different, but here I'm just asking how many electrons I need to fill these low energy more in mini bands. The primary difference here is that we additionally see insulating states or resistive dips at a variety of commensurate partial fillings of this band. So we see a robust insulating state in this sample at half filling of uh, the valence band, but also dips at you know, three quarter and quarters filling as well. And again, we can start to understand this from this uh, quantum Hall ferromagnet type analog, where if I fill some subset of these bands, then strong exchange interactions may gap out the rest of the states and can leave you in, a, in an insulating state where you're only filling a subset of, uh, you know, of, of these symmetry resolved bands. Okay, so to confuse you a bit, I'm going to switch to measuring resistance now instead of conductance. And I'm going to go to a sample with a slightly different twist angle and show you the resistance as a function of doping and as a function of temperature. So again, we see that we have these uh, correlated insulating states at half filling and three quarters filling of the band. But we also see now that if we dope away uh, from half filling, the resistance drops uh, precipitously as we cool the system down and eventually saturates at the noise floor, zero ohms more or less. And if I just park the gates here or here and measure the resistance as a function of temperature, you can see that over a small uh, range of temperature, the resistance drops by orders of magnitude and uh, 
and saturates at zero. So this is suggestive of a, of a superconducting transition in the system. And so what this means is that simply by doping, within a single material, we can map out this rather complex phase diagram where we can tune the system from a metallic state uh, in blue here, where as I measure the resistance as a function of temperature, it doesn't change strongly, to a superconducting state in this uh, cyan pocket, to a correlated insulating state in this red and yellow region where the resistance diverges as the system is cooled down, and then back again. So there's a, a wide variety of different phases that all can be accessed uh, dynamically and non-destructively within a single material simply by doping. And uh, likely everyone knows, but I, I just want to point out that this, this was first discovered by Pablo Herrera Herrera's group at MIT in March of 2018. And the work that I'm showing you here is work that I did uh, shortly thereafter uh, while I was at Columbia in my postdoc, effectively first verifying that these correlated states and superconductivity do indeed exist. Okay. Um, so one question that will be important is how do we actually know that this state is a superconducting state? You know, there's more than one reason why you might see very low resistance. For example, a ballistic metal can give you effectively zero resistance if measured correctly. So why do we think this is actually a superconducting state? Uh, well, you know, one unfortunate feature of these systems, which turns out to be fortunate in this case, is that they're not structurally homogenous. You know, this cartoon image of a moray pattern that's, you know, perfectly uniform over large areas is not actually what we get in reality. You know, in reality, these, these graphene sheets are more like saran wrap. They can easily deform. And if you try to put them on top of each other at a small twist angle, they really want to go back to their energetically preferred Bernal stacking. And so they kind of rotate and strain locally, and, and this leads to inhomogeneities in, uh, in this moray pattern, even over fairly small lane scales. And we can detect that by measuring transport between different pairs of electrodes in the sample, and realizing that the doping that we need to achieve full filling of this band is different depending on where we're measuring in the sample. So that's kind of a, an indirect insight into this uh, structural inhomogeneity. And there's not been a number of local probe measurements that really directly prove this. So that's a bit unfortunate for measuring uh, or accessing really the intrinsic properties of these systems. But what it gives us for free is effectively a, a Josephson network in these samples, where if we dope to just over a half filling, uh, in some regions of the sample, the twist angle may be different in other regions of the sample, and that may put us in an insulating or a metallic state at the same absolute doping. And this can lead to a series of somewhat random superconducting, weakling superconducting junctions. And the manifestation of this is that when we measure the critical current as a function of magnetic field, we see that it oscillates. So it's perhaps most clear here and here uh, at different dopings. You know, what I'm showing you is the differential conductance as a function of uh, DC current bias and magnetic field. And the critical current is at this black-red interface. And you can see that it oscillates with doping. So this oscillation looks like uh, Fraunhofer oscillation. And it's kind of a smoking gun evidence of phase coherent transport and would be somewhat difficult to interpret um, other than as a signature of superconductivity. OK. Um, so, uh, you know, another way that we can tune this system is uh, by tuning the bandwidth directly at a fixed twist angle. Um, so let me, let me just speed up a little bit here and say that, uh, you know, what we've talked about so far is fixing this interlayer hybridization gap, but changing the twist angle to modify these flat bands. But another potential route that we could take is to fix the twist angle and directly tune the size of this hybridization gap um, by modifying the interlayer coupling strength. And this would also provide a route towards realizing dynamic band flattening in the system. And so fortunately, this uh, pressure technique, which I developed, was exactly the right tool that you'd want to use to do this. And so uh, what we did was to measure a sample at a twist angle of about 1.3 degrees, which is above uh, the nominal magic angle of twisted bilayer graphene. The bandwidth is too large to support correlated states at low temperature. And at this twist angle, we only see these very weak dips in conductance at commensurate uh, uh, partial fillings of the band because the system is not very strongly correlated. But now as we apply pressure, we expect that we should be able to dynamically flatten these bands. And indeed, when we go to about 2.2 gigapascal, what we find is that you know, now we see very robust insulating states 
uh, a number of different uh, quarter and three quarters filling of these bands. And also if I again show this to you in resistance instead of conductance, what you find is that at ambient pressure, the system is always a metal, it's always 100 ohms or above. But at high pressure, there's a region of doping just above half filling where the resistance drops to the noise floor. So again, if I, if I just take a cut here of the resistance versus temperature at the doping corresponding to this blue arrow, it looks like a metal at ambient pressure, um, but you can see a clear superconducting transition where the resistance rapidly drops to zero at high pressure. So this tells us that both superconductivity and these correlated insulating states can be driven in a sample uh, by applying pressure, whereas they're not uh, the ground state at ambient pressure. Okay, so there's a question, how do I know that twist angle does not change as I apply pressure, bring the layers closer? Yeah, so that's a fantastic question. Uh, the way we know that is effectively by, um, so the, the doping that we need to, to achieve full filling will indeed change, but also the capacitance between the graphene and the graphite uh, flake that we're using as a back gate changes. Because the boron nitride is our dielectric and the boron nitride is also a layered van der Waals structure. So as we apply pressure, all of the layers of all of these van der Waals materials compress and uh, and uh, the capacitance between the twisted bilayer graphene and the back gate grows. And if you characterize this capacitance either with um, low field quantum oscillations or low field Hall effect, then you can normalize this effect out. And then you can ask, what is the actual charge doping you need to achieve full filling? And you find out that that turns out to be the same. So uh, we're pretty certain that the twist angle is not changing, just the amplitude of the Moray potential. So hopefully that answers that question, but please ask again if not. Okay, so what we can do now to characterize this is measure uh, the strength of correlations either using TC of the superconducting state or the energy gap of the correlated insulating state as a proxy for the strength of the correlations. And we can do that as a function of pressure. Um, I admit that a, a plot with three data points is not particularly impressive, um, but you know, applying pressure is, it turns out to be a slow and painful process. So if you'll allow me to make inference from this, what we find is that the correlation strength changes non-monotonically with pressure and peaks around 1.3 gigapascal, at least within our, our course resolution here. Now, theoretical work that was done contemporaneously with our experiment predicted that the magic angle actually should depend on pressure for the kind of cartoon reason, uh, reason that I described. And, uh, you know, their calculation suggested that the flat band or the flattest band, um, which is mapped out in this red dotted line as a function of twist angle and pressure, uh, at a pressure of about 1.3 degrees, uh, or at a pressure of about, or a twist angle of about 1.3 degrees, should correspond to a pressure of about 1.5 or so gigapascal. And, you know, as you go to higher pressure at a fixed twist angle, the bands start to unflatten and correlations become less relevant. And indeed, this is consistent with this uh, rough trend that, that we observed. So we think that we've, we've gained dynamic control over the strength of correlations in the system, not just by tuning the twist angle, but now by applying pressure within a single device, where we don't have to worry about random disorder in the structure changing between different samples. OK. So that was work that I did as a postdoc. Uh, for the rest of the talk now, I, I want to quickly tell you about some of the things that I've been doing more recently um, since moving to a faculty position here at UW. And uh, what we've been focusing on is not twisted bilayer graphene, but twisted multi-layers of graphene. So I'm going to tell you about twisted double bilayer graphene, which are four layers of graphene, uh, two Bernal stack bilayers at a twist. And then I'll move on to monolayer bilayer graphene, which even though it's fewer layers, turns out to be a bit more complicated. So, uh, you know, I've described so far how you can get flat bands in twisted bilayer graphene. It turns out that that's really a special case, and there's a more generic property of twisting semiconducting band structures in general, where you can get these flat bands owing to this interlayer more coupling. So bilayer graphene, rather than having this uh, linear direct dispersion, has a parabolic direct dispersion, and uh, you know, if I go through the same exercise of twisting and, and hybridizing these uh, parabolic bands, what I find is that, you know, in principle, I could go through the same recipe to get flat bands. But now I have an additional control knob. As I apply in a perpendicular electric field, I can create a band gap 
between these parabolic bands and each of the graphene bilayers by themselves. And combined, this leads to the ability to control the band gap in uh, the overall twisted double bilayer graphene uh, band structure. So I told you that you couldn't uh, gap the bands in twisted bilayer graphene because of the C2 symmetry that protects them. In twisted double bilayer graphene and really in other, any other twisted system that we know, we don't have this C2 symmetry. So we can control not only the band gap at full filling, but also the band gap at the charge neutral point. And this gives us a wider range of, of twist angles over which we can uh, achieve flat bands. So following the discovery of twisted bilayer graphene about a, you know, a year later, there were a number of uh, nearly contemporaneous works from groups around the world looking at what happens in twisted bilayer bilayer graphene, or what I call twisted double bilayer graphene. And so in this case, what they found was that there are correlated insulating states that also emerge at half and quarter fillings of the bands but these can further be done by an electric field or a displacement field, which is now being shown on the vertical axis. So we have additional control over these states. There were also curious features that were, that were observed when you dove slightly away from uh, these correlated insulating states, where it was found that the resistance would drop precipitously or abruptly uh, to a very small value, sometimes zero, usually not zero, um, but at a fairly high temperature, something like six to 10 Kelvin, and you know, with potential signatures of, of spin triplet pairing, if this were really a superconducting state. Um, so the question that we wanted to ask is, you know, despite the similarity or the kind of appearance of superconductivity in, in the system, is that really what's going on or is there some other understanding uh, of this behavior? Uh, so to do this, we construct structures of uh, bilayer bilayer graphene with a small twist angle of just over one degree. And um, you know, we can calculate the band structure. I, I simplified it on the prior slide. I, I'm showing it in a bit more detail here as a function of the interlayer electric field. What you see is that the system is a band overlap semi-metal at small electric field, and that we can create a gap between the more a uh, conduction and valence bands as we apply an electric field. But this is complicated. It comes at the expense of these energy gaps to these remote dispersive bands and it also changes the bandwidth dynamically as we apply an electric field. So really a lot is changing as, as we tune the electric field in the system. But nevertheless, we can calculate the density of states as a function of the band filling and as a function of electric field. And what we find is that in addition to these energy gaps at full filling in the neutrality point, uh, we also have uh, you know, a slew of in-host singularities that kind of drift around uh, different, different fillings of these flat bands. So, uh, you know, the first thing that we can, okay, this is another question. Is a hybridized gap or a trivial interlayer ionic difference gap? Um, it's, a, it's a hybridization gap. Okay, so it depends which gap you're talking about. The gap at full filling here is a hybridization gap that comes from the moray potential. The gap at the neutrality point is coming more just from kind of sloshing electrons to outer layers of the, of the four layer structure with the electric field. But to really understand it in detail, you do have to do a, a kind of a full band structure calculation. Okay, cool, good. All right, so what we can do is measure this system at high temperature, you know, just to understand the single particle band structure. I, I wanna go to a temperature where I don't think correlations may be playing any role at all, or at least not something, you know, substantial. And uh, what I'm showing you now is a measurement of the resistivity of the sample in the color scale as a function of the doping or the band filling factor on the horizontal axis and the electric field or the displacement field in the vertical axis. So I've kind of switched convention here to be more consistent with the quantum Hall ferromagnet language where I'm using nu as the filling factor. So filling factor of four corresponds to complete filling of the low energy uh, more conduction band, or minus four is fulfilling of the Moray valence band, where four comes from two spin and two valley degree of freedom in the graphene. Okay, so the basic phenomenology that we see is that the neutrality point, the system is a semi-metal at small electric field, but turns into an insulator above some critical electric field. You can see the resistance goes from small to large, and that's captured within the single particle prediction, 
And then we also see these uh, gaps at full band filling that close as we apply a large electric field. And again, that's also captured in uh, our band structure calculations. And then we see these weak modulations of the resistivity, for example, forming a cross-like feature on the valence band side. And that's reminiscent of this cross-like uh, dispersion of the Van Hove singularity. Okay, so we think that most of this we can understand from a single particle picture. So now I'm going to take the system to 20 millikelvin and ask uh, what features persist and what new ones emerge. And uh, so everything that I just described persists, the gaps that we see, these cross-like features, but something new emerges. Uh, what we see are additional insulating states at half band filling and more weakly at quarter and three quarters band filling um, over a finite range of displacement field within the Moray conduction band. And uh, because a single particle picture has no natural mechanism to describe an insulating state at partial band filling, we ascribe these uh, to be uh, originating from correlations. We also see this halo-like feature enclosing these states. And this halo-like feature is marked by a weak step in uh, the base temperature resistivity. And so, you know, all of this remains to really be completely understood. The other way that we can characterize the system is by measuring the Hall coefficient at low field. And uh, so I don't want to get into precisely the details of what everything means here. What's important is just whether the color is red, blue, or white. You know, so red or red, blue correspond to electron or hole type carriers, and white is the balance between the two. So at low electric field, we see that the system has a number of sign changes um, as we cross different uh, energy gaps in the system and switch from electron to hole type carriers. And all of these are understood within the single particle model. But then at large electric field corresponding to this halo-like feature, we see unexpected inversions in the sign of uh, the Hall coefficient. And if we go around three quarters filling or quarter filling, we see yet another type of inversion again. And uh, these can be understood as a consequence of uh, symmetry breaking within these uh, flat low energy bands owing to the effects of correlations at low temperature. So at small electric field, we have a fourfold degenerate band. And if we're probing below half filling, uh, you know, we may be probing say electron type carriers just below the Van Ho singularity. When we go into this uh, correlated region and uh, neighboring a correlated insulating state, then we expect a gap to open uh, between different uh, different isospin symmetries within, within these bands. And now at the same filling factor, we may be probing above a Van Ho singularity of a symmetry broken band. So this will switch the sign of the Hall coefficient. So what this halo is telling us is something about a footprint of where correlations are able to spontaneously break a symmetry within uh, these low energy Moray mini bands. Okay. Uh, so, uh, the next thing that we want to do is characterize what happens as a function of temperature. So, uh, what I'm going to show you is somewhat of a kind of data complicated plot where we measure the resistance as a function of temperature at different filling factors and as a function of different displacement fields. So, basically, each one of these panels is corresponding to a vertical cut along this uh, doping displacement field map. So this one is at half filling, cutting through the correlated insulating state. And as I measure the resistivity as a function of temperature, I see that it diverges, you know, goes to a high value as I cool the system down. But it does this as a function of displacement fields. And if I map it out on displacement field on this axis, it forms this arch-like feature where the, the metal insulator transition happens at the highest temperature, kind of in the center of this correlated insulating state at some critical displacement field, and then uh, the temperature at which this metal insulator transition happens drops to zero as I detune the displacement field from this optimal value. Now, if I do the same measurement, but dope away from precisely half filling, I see that a similar arch-like feature persists, but now it's not a metal insulator transition. It actually becomes more metallic. It becomes lower resistivity at low temperature. So we can map this out by just taking individual cuts here along these uh, colored vertical lines or at dots here along uh, on this uh, doping displacement field plot. And what you find is that if you uh, measure the resistivity as a function of temperature on the correlated insulating state, you see that the resistance goes from a, a metallic-like behavior to an insulator-like behavior at around 15 Kelvin. 
And then if I detune, so I stay within the halo, but I detune away from exactly half filling, I see that there's this linear and temperature dependence, and then there's this abrupt drop in resistivity before saturating to a small value. Whereas in contrast, if I do the same measurement outside this halo-like region, uh, what you see is a, you know, more of a standard graphene-like behavior, where you have a linear and temperature dependence that simply saturates to a, to a finite value at low temperature. OK, so what I want to argue is that while superficially similar to superconductivity, this feature is actually, I think, more related to uh, the consequence of spontaneous symmetry breaking within these bands, owing to the nearby formation of the correlated insulating state. So I, I want to go a little bit quickly here, since I'm short on time and, and don't want to go too far over. Uh, but what I want to say is by measuring the Hull coefficient as a function of temperature, we can effectively realize that uh, uh, you know, this, this Hull coefficient is strongly temperature dependent in a way that the resistivity is as well. And so if we sit at a fixed uh, doping and electric field just away from half filling, we can actually change the sign of the Hall coefficient with temperature. And so this is a signature of uh, correlations, you know, spontaneously uh, gapping these bands as they break a symmetry. And we can use the sign of the Hall coefficient to map out a kind of a cartoon phase diagram of what the degeneracy is within uh, this doping and electric field uh, you know, phase diagram of twisted bilayer, twisted double bilayer graphene. So where it's colored in blue, we have fourfold, uh, the parent fourfold degeneracy. In green, uh, correlations are able to spontaneously break a symmetry and we're reduced to twofold degeneracy. And then in orange, we break all the symmetries and we have no remaining degeneracies. And by measuring this uh, correlated insulating gap with an in-plane magnetic field, we think that these excitations are spin polarized. Um, so uh, these bands, you can think of them as being ferromagnetic metals. So this gives us a way to now interpret why we might be seeing these abrupt resistivity drops with temperature. At high temperature, where correlations are not able to spontaneously break a symmetry, you know, we have uh, no magnetic ordering in the system. And at low temperature, these states are magnetically ordered. And um, similar to what's observed when you measure, you know, any wide variety of ferromagnets or antiferromagnets, as you cool below the Curie or Neal ordering temperature, you see, you often see an abrupt drop in resistivity owing to the reduced scattering um, from electrons from fluctuating spins. Um, so we think that these, uh, you know, potentially uh, generalized magnon type scattering uh, may be responsible for this, this feature that resembles superconductivity, but we think may not necessarily be. And again, uh, you know, the, the smoking gun evidence that we're able to see without Meissner effect in two dimensions is the signatures of Fraunhofer type oscillations. And in twisted double bilayer graphene, we, we never see Fraunhofer oscillations, at least in the samples that we've measured. And there's a number of other systems in which you see these abrupt drops in resistivity. Uh, ABC trilayer graphene aligned with boron nitride or twisted WSE2, which, uh, you know, resembles superconductivity, um, but potentially may not be. Um, so we think this is an important feature and, and certainly something that, you know, we're, we still have more investigation that we need to do. Okay, um, so I'm going to go a little bit fast here and just say that we can not only tune these correlated states with electric field and doping, but also uh, with twist angle. And uh, so we can you know, map this out over, over a wide range of twist angles owing to the uh, large tunability the electric field affords us. We can also tune these with pressure. So uh, I'm showing some preliminary work where we take a twisted double bilayer graphene sample at 1.25 degrees and uh, we apply pressure and this effectively allows us to eliminate this correlated insulating state. And we think that if we do this with a different uh, twist angle, we'd actually be able to strengthen the correlated insulating state. But this is work in progress, and I, I don't have much more to say about this for now. OK, so the last thing I want to say is, uh, how much longer do I have? Do I have five more minutes, maybe? Um, five minutes or so, yeah. OK, all right, I'll, I'll try to wrap this up in five minutes. Um, so I've shown you a lot about tunable correlation so far, and I, I just want to uh, introduce a system in which we've also discovered tunable topology. 
Um, so, uh, so what I want to tell you about is twisted monolayer bilayer graphing. And um, this system has uh, yet reduced symmetry from twisted double bilayer graphing. Because if you invert the top and bottom components, you get something different. So now an electric field pointing up is different from an electric field pointing down. Uh, these band structures are not identical. And uh, let, me, let me just skip this and just say that if we measure the resistivity now as a function of electric field in, in either the, the positive or negative directions, we get very different uh, signatures of correlated insulating states. So we no longer have this uh, plus minus D symmetry. And these correlated states that we see, you know, are distinctly different for positive and, and negative electric field. Essentially because we're either polarizing carriers towards the monolayer graphene or towards the bilayer graphene. And uh, the band structures are just different as we do this. So in one case, it resembles effectively twisted double bilayer graphene, uh, but missing one layer. And in another case, their local density of states resembles twisted bilayer graphene but with an extra weakly charged layer that may act as a screening layer. And so we can kind of make uh, parallels between the way this state looks and the way it looks in twisted double bilayer graphene when we polarize towards the bilayer graphene and vice versa when we polarize towards the monolayer graphene. So this is yet an even high, more highly tunable system uh, owing to this slope symmetry. Another important thing here is that these, uh, you know, these bands are expected to have non-trivial churn numbers. And um, these are highly tunable with twist angle and electric field. And these also satisfy the ingredients that we would need to find a quantum anomalous Hall effect. So we need non-trivial churn bands, which is trivially satisfied. Uh, we need uh, magnetic ordering, which I'll tell you about in the next slide. And we need a gap at partial band filling to polarize into a subset of these churn states. And so was there a question? OK. So, uh, you know, sorry this is a little bit fast, but um, we've, what, what we found in the system and in other twisted uh, Moray van der Waals heterostructures is an entirely new form of magnetism that's not driven by arrangement or organization of electron spins, but rather by spontaneous uh, orbital motion of the electrons. So when we polarize into a subset of these bands, say at the K or K prime values, these have some sort of chirality and that chirality can lead to a spontaneous breaking of time reversal symmetry. And this is a, a, a new feature called orbital ferromagnetism. And this orbital ferromagnetism with non-trivial band topology has led in a number of systems, uh, twisted bilayer line with BN and trilayer graphene to the observation of a quantum anomalous Hall effect. The challenge here is that these systems are complicated. They require multiple Moray patterns or control of internal stacking degrees of freedom that are just experimentally difficult to realize. And so far, there's only been kind of one or two of each of these flavor of samples that have ever been made. Uh, in twisted trilayer or twisted bilayer monolayer graphene, what we find is an all graphene, uh, you know, orbital ferromagnetism that can lead to a quantum anomalous Hall effect. So if I show you what happens at quarter filling on the positive displacement field side of a twist angle, of a sample of twist angle of about 0.9 degrees, what we find is that when we measure uh, the Hall effect at zero magnetic field or a very small magnetic field, it's very large, something like tens of kilo ohms. And if I just sweep the field back and forth and measure uh, rho xy as a function of the field, you can see this very clear hysteresis loop um, with large but not exactly quantized uh, Hall coefficient. Um, so I unfortunately don't have time to, to tell you about the details of this. But we think this is an incipient quantum anomalous Hall state. And we've, we and uh, Andrea Young's group at Santa Barbara have seen similar features um, with, uh, with twist angles of you know, very different twist angles, potentially even with tunability in the churn number from one to two. So we think this is an exciting system in which we can realize both strongly correlated states, but also uh, topological states that can lead to the observation of the quantum anomalous Hall effect. Okay. Um, so I, I want to respect everyone's time and, and just, uh, you know, thank my collaborators, uh, my, my postdoc advisor, Corey Dean from Columbia, and more recently, Xiaonong Zhu's group, in which a lot of this work has done, been done collaboratively. And I will just leave up my, leave up my conclusion slide and, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Matt, for the really nice talk.
Uh, so the seminar is now open to questions. If you have any questions. Um, So I see one question from Arvinder. In the twisted bilayer, in the twisted the double bilayer graphing, is a linear uh, resistivity versus temperature possibly related to uh, quantum critical behavior near the phase transition? Yeah, that's a that's a really really good question. So it turns out that this linear R versus T is something that's ubiquitous in these twisted. Uh, it's relatively ubiquitous in these twisted graphing or really even like any of these twisted Moray heterostructures. In fact, linear versus, you know, linear R versus T is something that's found in monolayer graphene. The difference here is just that the slope is very large. You know, in monolayer graphene, the slope of uh, the resistance versus temperature is something on the order of like a fraction of an ohm per Kelvin, whereas here it can be hundreds of ohms per Kelvin. So I think the question is, in addition to why is it linear, why is the slope so large? And, uh, you know, there's been a number of different uh, potential explanations. Um, some of my own work that we that we that I didn't present uh, relates this to potential uh, phonon models. Um, there are some challenges in actually getting all of the details right using phonons. So I think your suggestion that you know there's some sort of uh, some sort of like magnon scattering may may be playing a role here is. Uh, you know, it's also becoming a popular idea that, that people are investigating theoretically and experimentally. Um, so I, I think this is, you know, this is still very much an open question. Uh, we've, we've started to map out the phenomenology, but we, we still need, you know, some, some theory assistance, I think, to really, to really unlock exactly what's going on with these, with these features. Any other question? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, oh, uh, so um, just sort of like philosophical high level question, like all of these, um, all of these uh, heteros heterostructures with these amazing electronic properties, like if I had been, you know, in, in the early days of graphene and a student said, let's make these heterostructures by just picking up flakes and mashing them together, I would say that's a terrible idea. Don't try it. It's going to, like, if, if you want to make a nice header structure, you have to do MBE or something. It's going to be really hard. You can't just pick things up in ambient conditions and mash them together. Uh, and so is this just, like, incredibly surprising, or did, did someone, was it, if you, someone, like, foresee this, that, oh, no, it, it's going to work because somehow impurities don't go in there or something? No, I, I don't think that. I think that it's really good fortune and, you know, uh, the right amount of like persistence to do this. So, um, the idea. Okay, so I mean, the kind of the history is like the idea originated from, from the challenge of having graphene exfoliated onto these like, you know, silicon dioxide substrates that inherently have these trapped charge disorders and are also amorphous. So you know, the graphene conforms to them and then the charge disorder in the SiO2 creates mirror charges in the graphene and that, that disorders the system. So there was a feeling that, and, and this was really largely driven by, you know, in around 2010 by my postdoc advisor, Corey, there was an idea that if you could instead have like an atomically flat and pristine Van der Waals substrate for graphene, you know, this might improve the situation. And so I, I've really skipped over a lot of the complexity and a lot of the frustration in developing the ability to actually make these structures in a very clean way. You know, this is something that we're, we're even to this day still understanding how to do very well. But kind of the, the, the important thing about these Van der Waals materials, like really the critical thing that allows this to work is that the Van der Waals adhesions between these flakes will create a kind of self-aggregation effect of any hydrocarbon residue that might exist on the surfaces. And, um, you know, so when you stack these materials together, you see that it forms these like bubbles or pockets of contamination that you can kind of squeeze out of the area that you care about when you laminate it onto the substrate. And that really leaves you with like a, a really interfacially pristine, uh, you know, heterostructure. And 
And then you're limited by like even the gating conditions. So we used to evaporate metal gates, but we realized that the grains and the metal gates that you evaporate have slightly different work functions. And those lead to like kind of a, you know, potential landscape and homogeneity in the graphene. So then we switched to encapsulating with graphite and, you know, all of these steps like further and further improve the quality of these structures. And at this point, we think we're limited by you know, the intrinsic defect concentration in the boron nitride crystals themselves, if anything, or maybe even just the intrinsic ripples that create vector potentials in the graphene itself, because we can't really have like a perfectly flat graphene sheet. Um, so we, we've kind of reached this point in materials engineering where kind of following the history of MBE, you know, that we've, we've got to the point where we can make these structures and they're pretty clean. And, you know, now, now we're able to, Kind of focus as much on doing new things with them as we are on continuing the the, the fabrication development but the, the benefit here over mbe is that we don't have any interfacial lattice matching constraints when we when we assemble these structures so whereas if i wanted to grow by mbe you know some sort of like twisted graphene structure some sort of structure of two different materials that have 40 percent lattice mismatch that simply wouldn't be possible but because you're doing this mechanical process where you're, you know, forcibly picking up these layers one by one, luckily nature has allowed it to, to be a viable process. And, um, you know, so that, that's, that's the thing that we're exploiting. So I think that's a really, you know, philosophically, it's an interesting question. I don't think anyone would have predicted that it would possibly work this well, but we're glad that it does. And now it's, it's fairly commonplace to be able to do this. Thanks, Jesse. I think uh, I see Harsh has another uh, question. Uh, is it known that the superconducting state in the bi um, bilayer graphene is S, uh, S wave or D wave? The short answer is no. Uh, so we that's that's really a fundamental important question, and you know I think a question that that would lead to is whether you know another related question is whether uh, you know the glue of Cooper pairs here is phonon or electron mediated. You know, how conventional is superconductivity in twisted bilayer graphene? And how tempted should I be to kind of map this on to like a cuprate phase diagram? Um, so understanding the symmetry of the order parameter of the superconducting state would be a good first step. Uh, you know, we see signatures of like pi junctions in our Fraunhofer oscillations, which may be a signature that it's D-wave, but we also know that there's ferromagnetic metal states hanging around in twisted bilayer graphene, and that can also lead to these type of like pi junctions. Um, I think that you know more direct control over like angle tunable Josephson junctions could lead to some insight into this question. In principle, you know, tunneling microscopy probes could also do this as well, but it's been pretty difficult so far, as much as I understand. Uh, to actually see the superconducting state in STM. So that, that's still an outstanding challenge. Um, but I think that you're absolutely right. You know, in a carefully constructed measurement in a Josephson junction, then the Fraunhofer patterns could tell you something about the symmetry of the order parameter. And hopefully that may lead to some insight into what is the actual nature of pairing in the superconducting state. You know, we see that, you know, the, so the community has found that you don't actually need to be proximate to a correlated insulating state to get superconductivity. So the direct mapping onto a cuprate phase diagram, I think, is something that uh, we've, we've moved away from. But certainly there's many signatures that something is unconventional about, you know, superconductivity and twisted bilayer graphene. It happens at extremely low densities. It happens, you know, in particular symmetry broken Fermi surfaces. Um, so I, I think there's, you know, this is really one of the big challenges that we're still trying to understand. I think we're, we're running a little late, so um, let's thank Matt again for the nice talk. And if you want to have uh, uh, further questions, you can stay a little longer for the unrecorded session of informal discussion with Matt. Thank you all. Stop the recording. Thank you all for coming.